If you want to retire early or achieve financial independence as soon as you can, it can be hard to know what to focus on. Should you be consolidating your pensions, making changes to your investments, trying to find a lower cost platform, or are there tax saving opportunities that you're missing? Which is made worse by all of the conflicting opinions that you find online and the current news cycle pushing threats of legislation changes every other week. With all this noise, it's hard to know where to start. As a financial advisor, I see this all of the time in the people that reach out to me for help. Their heads are often so stuck in the details that they miss the bigger picture. They miss the woods for the trees. Because if you zoom out, if you simplify what it actually takes to retire early, you will see that there is one thing that you should be focusing on over all else. The math is simple, it's obvious really, but I find that so many people get caught up in the details that they don't give this the attention it deserves. So today, we're going to distill the pursuit of financial independence down into its simplest form. Give you that 30,000 foot view where it's easy to see what you should be focusing on and the dramatic impact that even small changes can make. This video is inspired by a post by Mr. Money Mustache, a financial independence blogger in the US. And although I don't agree with everything he says all of the time, he is a fantastic writer and he has inspired hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to start taking financial planning seriously and make the most of their lives. And this is one of his most popular posts because it strips back all of the detail, all of the noise to give you one actionable thing that you need to focus on above all else. Financial independence is the point at which you have built up enough assets that those assets can comfortably support your expenditure into the future, meaning that you no longer have to work. And if we zoom all the way out, how long it takes you to reach this point is primarily dependent on one factor, your savings rate as a percentage of your take-home pay, which is made up of your take-home pay, how much of that you're able to save each month with the rest being expenditure. We then add back in any pension contributions because really that is also part of your take-home pay. As an example, if your take-home pay was £2,000 per month and you're saving £200 of that, but between you and your employer, you're putting £200 a month into your pension, your savings rate is 18%. If somebody told me that they're saving £400 a month and asked, is that any good? I have no idea because it all depends on what your goals are. But if they said that they had a savings rate of 18%, well, that tells me a lot because now I know how much they're saving compared with the lifestyle that they're living. At one end of the spectrum, if your savings rate is zero, you will never be able to retire. Unless you are planning on being entirely dependent on a state pension or defined benefit pension in retirement. Whilst at the other end of the spectrum, if you were able to save 99% of your income, you would rapidly accumulate many times your expenditure in assets, more than enough to be able to retire within a year. This is obvious, but what happens between these two extremes is not so obvious. Because when you start investing, with some luck, your money will grow. At first, it might not seem like much, but if you stick with it after years, after decades, that growth can compound, growth on top of growth, until it can turn away into a runaway exponential snowball. This is where interesting things start to happen. And as you're about to see, even small changes can make huge differences over time. But it's hard to appreciate these patterns if your head is stuck in the details. So let's zoom out and get you some perspective. How long it takes you to reach financial independence is a function of your savings rate. And that function is not a straight line. It's an exponential curve. On the x-axis, we have the savings rate. And on the y-axis, we have how many years it would take you to become financially independent and be ready to retire. If you save 99% of your income, it will take just a few months. If you save nothing, you're never going to get there. But what's interesting is what happens in this corner. But before we take a closer look, we need to recognize that your savings rate is not the only factor here. To make this graph, we've had to make some other assumptions. The first is, what investment return are we expecting after adjusting for inflation? And then how are we defining the point at which we have achieved financial independence? To start with, we're going to use the assumptions that he used in the block, which is a 5% real return and the definition of being ready to retire is having 25 times more assets than your expenditure, which is derived from the 4% rule. Both of these are important assumptions, and as we'll see later in the video, they interact with your savings rate in some really interesting ways. So here, this is suggesting that if you had a 5% savings rate, it would take 65 years to get to the point where you have built up enough assets to be able to sustain your current expenditure 
through retirement after adjusting for inflation. As we go through this, please don't get disheartened by these numbers because we've zoomed out so far here that you can't directly map this onto your own situation. As an example, in this simple model, we are assuming that you fund all of your expenditure in retirement from your investments. But if you are expecting the state pension or a DB pension to cover a big chunk of your spending in retirement, then you know, your time to retirement could be a lot less. We're also not considering tax or variable spending. But by zooming out like this, it helps us to identify patterns that remain true even when you add all of the detail back in. For example, if we push our savings rate up by 5%, we would shave 15 years off our time to retirement. If we push it up to 15%, that's another nine years off. Up to 20%, we're down to 36 years, and at 25%, we're down to 31 years. Down this end of the graph, where you're starting from a low base, small increases can make a massive difference. It's obvious, really. If you can learn to live on less and save more, the quicker you're going to get to financial independence. But when you're sitting there weighing up what car you're gonna lease next, whether to go for the full Sky package or if you really need that premium gym membership, it's hard to appreciate the true cost of these things, what they cost in time, in years, Increase your savings rate by 5% to 15% and you get 23 years back. From this distance, it all becomes painfully clear. With that said, although the maths is simple, that does not mean that this is easy, especially when the cost of living has been rising so fast recently. But zooming out like this and seeing the difference that even small changes can make should be motivating. And here's the thing. Let's say you wanted to find another £100 a month to invest. You'd either have to go out and earn more money so that after tax you're left with an extra £100 or cut your spending by £100. In both scenarios, you're investing an extra £100 a month up to the point of retirement. But in our model, if you can learn to live on less before you retire, that means you're also spending less throughout retirement, which allows you to get to financial independence much faster. Of course, in real life, your spending is going to change over time. But that still does not take away from the fact that if you can learn to live on less, permanently, that is twice as powerful as earning more. Of course, ideally, you'd be trying to do both of these things, but arguably, your spending is something that you have a lot more control over. Now, you're probably looking at this thinking, if only someone had shown me this when I was in my 20s. Bumping up my savings rate just by a fraction would have made a huge difference. Well, yeah. If you do know somebody in your 20s, do them a favor, send them this video. But if you are later on in life, and you are already part way along this journey, this type of analysis is even more important because not only are you at the stage in your life where you're more likely to have your head stuck in the details, prevaricating over what to do with your pensions or optimizing investments, when what you really need to be doing is zooming out, taking stock of where you are now, working out roughly where you wanna be and understand the direction of travel that you need to be headed. I've left a link to this calculator down in the description of the video so that you can plug in your own numbers including you know, how much you've already saved and do exactly that. It will tell you how long it's going to take for you to be able to cover your costs based on what you're currently doing. And then you can play around with the numbers to see the effect that changes make. Just remember, it's super high level. Do not take the results literally, but it can help you to work out if you are headed in the right direction. Most people do not give their savings rate the attention it deserves. And the main reason for that is that spending less isn't sexy. It's not exciting. But trying to get a higher return on your investment or trying to save tax, well, that is. Now, both of these things are important too. No one wants to leave money on the table. But for the most part, unless you're going to be moving to Dubai, saving tax is not likely to move your needle anywhere near as much as your savings rate. And although investment returns can move the needle, after a point, they're less important than you think. Let me explain whilst I also address one of the problems with this blog post. I put the data from our original graph into a table so that you can more easily see the difference between each 5% savings rate band. To create these figures, we've assumed a 5% average annual return after accounting for inflation. But is that a sensible assumption? Here we're looking at stock market returns going back to 1900. And we can see that the US has been one of the best performing markets with an average annual return of 6.4% after adjusting for inflation, beaten only by Australia and South Africa. But many markets have performed worse, with the average global stock market return sitting at 5%. But that doesn't include fees, a margin for making mistakes or just getting unlucky. Hidden within these comforting averages are long periods of poor performance, and you don't know what you're going to get. As the saying goes, invest like an optimist, but save like a pessimist. And given that we are using this data to help us work out how much we need to save, it makes sense to be conservative here. 
What's more is that a 100% stock portfolio is not appropriate for a lot of people. So if you are turning down the heat by adding bonds to your portfolio, you should expect lower returns. So let's expand this to look at a range of different returns. Now, the first and most obvious point is that if you were to keep all of your money in a high interest savings account that is able to keep pace with inflation, and lots of them don't, yes, you are not taking risk with your money, but you are taking a risk that you're never going to be able to retire, unless you have a ridiculously high savings rate. On the other hand, if you invest to try and target a higher return, yes, the value of your money could fall in the short term, but if you do it properly, you are giving yourself a much better chance of achieving your long-term goals. But if you're already investing, how much of a difference do higher returns make? At a 40% savings rate, pushing up from a 3% return to a 6% return only cuts five years off our time to retirement. But at a 15% savings rate, it's 17 years. Which makes sense, because with a lower savings rate, you are saving for much longer, which means that that higher rate of return has more time to compound. But if you have a high savings rate, which people often do as they get close to retirement, your contributions are going to make up a much higher proportion of your final retirement pot. What's more is that to get from a 3% expected return to a 6% expected return, you're going to need to take a lot more risk with your investments. Very roughly, that could be like going from a 40% stock and bond portfolio to a 100% stock portfolio. And there is a lot of pain that comes with that, which few people can handle, especially as they get closer to retirement. But what's interesting is that if instead of ramping up the risk, you increased your savings rate by 10%, it would have the same effect. At a 40% savings rate, that is even more effective, shaving 6.4 years of time to retirement instead of five and a half. Getting the best investment return that you can for the level of risk that you can tolerate is extremely important. For most people that I talk to, that is the number one thing on their mind. And for many of them, yeah, there are improvements that can be made. But this is the thing. Once you have set yourself up correctly with a low cost, globally diversified passive portfolio, from that point, your investment returns are almost entirely out of your control. Yes, you could pour a huge amount of time, effort, and stress into trying to eke out a slightly higher return, perhaps by being more active with your portfolio. But not only is that not likely to move the needle much, but there's a decent chance that you could end up doing more harm than good. Which means that the only thing left to focus on that you actually have control over and that is really going to move the needle is your savings rate. If you really care about being able to retire early, this is what you need to focus on. Now, the other issue that people take with this blog post is that he's defined being ready to retire as having 25 times more in investments than you're planning on spending, which is based on the famous 4% rule, which comes from a study that looked back at almost 90 years of stock market data to assess what level of withdrawals in retirement would have been sustainable even in the worst sequence of returns. And they found that if you drew 4% of the starting value of your portfolio and then increase that by inflation every year, their simulation never ran out of money. However, the 4% rule has drawn criticism because it's only based on a 30-year retirement and many people these days will be retired for longer. And the study only looked at US markets, one of the best performing markets in history, which is probably not the best way to stress test your retirement plan. When other global studies have found sustainable withdrawal rates of 3.5%, if not lower. But firstly, as Mr. Money Mustache points out, no one should go into retirement expecting to spend the same amount every year. Instead, you should expect to flex your spending based on what happens in the markets. And secondly, if you're planning on retiring early, you're probably the type of person who has a high savings rate, say 30%, which based on our original assumptions would mean it takes you from a standing start 28 years until you have accumulated 25 times your expenditure as assets i.e. the 4% rule. But if when you get there, you decide that actually you think 4% is not conservative enough, you only want to retire once you can afford a 3.5% withdrawal rate, i.e. having 28.5 times your expenditure in assets, well, you only need to wait two more years. And another two years after that, and you're down to 3%. In these final years, the compounding snowball really starts to run away, which means a lot can happen over just a few short years. Of course, in reality, investment returns are not linear. They are volatile. And for this video, we've zoomed out so far that it can be hard to apply this directly to your own situation with any great accuracy, which is why 
you now need to watch this video here, where I do a back test of over a hundred years of stock market data to assess how much you would have actually needed to retire and sustain four different levels of expenditure and how things like a state pension, variable spending in retirement or different levels of investment risk can actually enable you to retire way earlier than has been suggested in this video. You gotta watch it, I'll see you there.